Providence, Rhode Island. Welcome to the Potterverse. It's a podcast dedicated to the book and film universe of Harry Potter. So grab your favorite wands and time turners. Let's step into the night and pursue that flighty temptress adventure. And welcome back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. (laughs) (laughs) My name is Mary Larson. My name is Blake. And man, it has been since March of 2022. That that was our last episode, Marvin. And now it is November of 2022. And we, we had to take a little bit of a break for very good reasons. But it's good to be back. I was ready to podcast about Potter again. Agreed. I I'm all in 100%. Thank you, everybody, if you're listening to this in real time for your patience and allowing us to do the other projects that we have going on at Mary and Blake Media in the meantime. And if you're listening into the future, you don't care because this has just been a five-minute break for you, <laughs> probably. I no idea. But in the meantime, just as a little aside, for those of you who have been patiently waiting Um, We want to thank you. One of the biggest issues that we have run across over these several months is I do have long COVID, and I still have long COVID. Um, I got COVID to begin with in February of this year, so guess what timetable? (laughs) (laughs) Had to start in March. Couldn't handle too much. So luckily, a lot of other things have now come off our plate. Potter is truly a place um, that, that brings us joy, that brings us happiness and I am so excited to be delving back into this book and into the series with you all as we go into the holiday season as we go into kind of the dark days of the year so we can bring some lumos into your lives and we want to thank you for your patience of course all right so you ready Blake yeah Marvin let's do it okay so we are jumping back in at chapter 30, which is titled The Pensieve. And um, I wanted to start things off. Of quick, course. Ha- quick question. <clears throat> yeah. Pronunciation. Are we going with pensive or pensive? I call it pensive. I call it pensive too. Okay. However, I feel like the broad world or the world abroad <laughs> calls it pensive. Okay. And it's kind of like Voldemort or Voldemort. So what do you... It just for our for our pronunciation here, Mar- Mary and Blake Media. How is I E supposed to sound? It's supposed to be E, but the long some, E. But the the, the thing the, the fact of the matter is uh, is that pensive or pensive is a play on pensive the fe- uh-huh. the feeling, and then sieve, which is a thing that allows you know allows a flow of whatever is coming out of it, right? So. It's a it's a it's a combination of two words. So is it a sieve? Is it a pensive? Is it pensive? I, I don't know. But sieve, S I E V E. I I understand. V-E. I agree with you. Pensive. How, I, I just hear a whole bunch of people Where do you call hear it pe- pensive. Where do you hear people call sieve? Uh, other podcasts in the books. He calls it a pensive in a book in hey, the book. Listen, Dale. Neville Longbottom doesn't even know how to uh, pronounce the woman who <laughs> Cruciatus cursed his parents. <laughs> In uh, Order of the Phoenix, sure. Okay, potato, potato. Yeah, that's what I'm but, saying. What but, do you want? To, what do you want to decide? What I say doing? Dobby's name different. Doesn't know people call him Dobby? Do- Dobby. If, if you say Dobby, you no, you got problems. No, you don't. People yeah, say yeah, different yeah. things. Dobby is potato, potato. Dobby is Dobby Gillis. But here, okay? it we ain't say Dobie, the elf. We say Pensieve in right. this family. So Mary and Blake Media House Larson is going to pronounce it Pensieve. Okay, oh fair. Gosh. Now I'm going to become. Like obsessed with listening to how different people say it in the movies. I'm telling you, it's how, a thing. Good thing Neville doesn't go near it because you know, <laughs> you know he messed that one up. <laughs> it's a pet peeve Poor of Neville. mine. Wait, it, we're barely four minutes into the podcast after <laughs> after like eight months or whatever it is. No, we're already it up picking on it's, Neville. It, no, it's talked about in this chapter. Yeah, but so I think it's apropos. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh my. Goodness. All right. So chapter thirty, the Pensieve. Okay. See, now I'm in my head about it. I've said it so many times now, it's lost its meaning. Here's my quote. I sometimes find, and I'm sure you know the feeling, that I simply have too many thoughts and memories crammed into my mind. That in and of itself, if I could have a pensive, granted, we all do, and you want to know what it's called? 
Siri. No. Alexa. No. You, you want to know called why? Facebook. No. Nope. Yeah. Well, Facebook's Facebook's a lot. Okay. <laughs> Facebook Face- is a lot. Facebook can be too much sometimes. It can sometimes be a bog art. Right. I. <laughs> <laughs> I flip and love. The That's p- a good connection. Ma- You're Mavin. welcome. You're already your sometimes own, my bog. Bring in the fire today. Hey, I may have chronic fatigue at this point, mm-hmm. heart issues. I don't even know what's wrong with me. <laughs> Truth, friends. But when it comes to Potter, I got lots of, lots of uh, the metaphors. Uh, Siri, Siri, I'm telling you, I tell Siri all the time. I should, you know, I should re-nickname my Siri. I can ask her. Can I call you Pensieve? Because I will say Siri. Remind me at such and such time about mm-hmm. this. Sometimes I just say, Siri, add this to my notes. And and she does. <laughs> and then I look back and I remember. Sometimes I find that I simply have too many thoughts and memories, especially when I'm driving and I don't oh, have time yeah. to act on those thoughts and memories. Mm-hmm. Hey, Siri, remind me. <laughs> Take note. <laughs> Uh, it's just not as cool. Driving is when you do your best thinking. Driving and when, uh, well, yeah, driving is definitely when you do your best thinking. For me, I'm in the shower. Good for you. I'm a total shower guy when I'm thinking. That's what I'm in on. I'm, I'm a driver. All right. You ready to get into the show, Mav? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Wanted to remind you, of course, that you can go to maryandblake.com to check out all the great podcasts there. And our community is jointhenerdclan.com. As a reminder to all of you, we are doing the crown at this moment, too, and it can be only found at jointhenerdclan.com. So if you are a fan of the crown and uh, season five of the crown, go to jointhenerdclan.com. Listen to Keep Calm and Crown on there. And another note as well, if you're listening to this in real time, we're getting close to the cutoff date where if you want to receive a holiday card or a gift from Mary and I in December, you're going to want to go to jointhenerdclan.com. And become a um, cl- uh, a kinsman level or a Sassanac level member at jointhenerdclan.com. Mm-hmm. So check that out there. And as always, if you want to give us some listener feedback uh, for the mail room, uh, you can email us at maryandblakemedia at gmail.com or go to maryandblake.com to leave us a voicemail there because that's a lot of fun. We want to hear your voice. We want to get into it. All right, Marvin, let's get into the show, shall we? We shall. I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. (sighs) Man, oh man. This chapter. Yeah, do do you want to do like a little chapter recap or yeah I, I do I yeah. do especially because okay. it's been you just pointed at me and I didn't know what the point meant we've been a lot, <laughs> a lot of practice here that's true it's normally been, it's we been would a have bit. a chapter recap but for those of you who did not freshly read chapter 30 of Goblet of Fire in this chapter we get to find the pensive um Harry goes up to go chat with Dumbledore, but Dumbledore's there with Fudge and Moody. They head on out for a little bit, and Harry falls into the Pensieve, into Dumbledore's memories, gets to first see uh, Karkov, Karkaroff being interrogated. Then he gets to see Ludo Bagman be interrogated. Can I just say, this book makes me miss Ludo Bagman as a character, and I'm so sad he didn't get to be in the movies. And then also, uh, we get to see the third trial, where we get to see um, uh, Barty Crouch Jr., Little Lestrange, you know, she's bananas. And we see someone else, I think, you know, because there's there's three people there. And loads, loads of Dementor time. And Harry and Dumbledore. It's not Lita Lestrange. No. It's Bella I said Little. Oh, Little. Little. Oh. Yeah. I thought you said no, Lita. Sorry. No, I meant Bella. Okay. Um, And then Dumbledore and Harry chat about what the Pensieve is. They talk a bit about what, what he just saw, about why Harry's scar potentially hurts, tells him, oh yeah, we're still missing Bertha, now Barty, and that guy Frank, Frank Bryce, and he tells him a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. And then he also says, so Harry, you kind of know a really big secret about Neville. Please don't tell anybody. Right. Thanks. Cross your heart, hope to die. <laughs> Ooh, a little too soon. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not too so, soon. You know, Mary, I, I think you brought up a great quote. And uh, as you know, your phrasing was used earlier, I think very apropos because my first thought about this chapter, well, I have two first main thoughts. One, the exposition in this chapter is expertly crafted. I, I mean, the author, I don't think, I don't think aside from, from uh, Mr. DNA, 
I don't think you can do a better job at exposition. Uh, oh, yeah. by the way, yeah, you're right, Mary. Where Where is my Jurassic Park sign? Here it is. Welcome to Jurassic Park. I don't, I don't think that you can do a better job with exposition uh, than what the author did in this chapter. It is perfect, and it is done in, in a way that is interesting, in a way that only I think it can be shown to you as or you know given to you as a reader uh, and then eventually in the, in the films shown to you um but the other part of this and i think this is where i want to start our conversation for this chapter mary and that is harry for the first time notices that dumbledore looks old yeah he looks old and tired and this comes on the heels of Dumbledore saying, sometimes I just have so many memories. And, and Harry, you know what, Harry? I'm sure you know. I just got so many different memories in my head that I know I know you felt like this too, right? Mm -hmm. That you just gotta, you gotta take the memories out. And Harry's response internally is, nah, I don't feel like that. I don't, I don't I've never felt like that. And it's not in a negative sense. It's just, this feels like the first time that Dumbledore gets something wrong. Mm-hmm. And it, and it feels like this I is mean, the first time. I mean, he gets this whole year wrong. Let's be real. Yeah, but uh, this is specifically wrong. And it's small, but it has to really do specifically with Harry. And it also feels to me like this is their first real encounter together where it's not the, hey, I'm Dumbledore and I'm going to talk to you at the end of the year and, every, and everything's going to be fun. Wee Hogwarts. This is a real thing that's happening between two people that are establishing an actual relationship now. Um, so once again, I, you know, even with this break, my friends, I am not changing my stance for this read through of seeing Dumbledore through different eyes. And I actually see it as Dumbledore seeing Harry as a more important um, person in his army purse, a uh, chess piece, if you may wizards, chess. Oh, um, a more important piece of this puzzle than he has given Harry credit for. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know why? I, why? I'm Harry freaking Potter. Preach. Yeah. And he, yes, he does start to speak to him a bit more like an equal. Uh, he shares things with him that, of course, you know, are a big deal. He has shared, you know, secrets with him in the past. I mean, heck, last year. He trusted Harry Potter to keep a secret about Sirius Black running away. Yeah, you know, one but of the that's most different. Notorious. I know, but like that's different. That's that's mega different, in my opinion. But as a headmaster looking at a thirteen-year-old, like what's the big difference between a thirteen-year-old versus a fourteen-year-old? But I think this is the point where he's starting to realize, like you said, that he's older um, and that he can't figure this out alone. And for Harry to now come in and have this happen. I think it happens so differently in the book than it does in the movies. In the movies, it almost looks like um, Dumbledore wants this to happen. You know, he he says, oh, hang into my room and you can have some candies and the candies bite Harry and then, you know, up opens the pensieve and it looks, it feels like in the movie that Dumbledore wanted that to happen. Whereas here in the book, that is not how it comes off whatsoever. I don't know if I, agree. I'm not sure if I can co-sign on that take. What, the movie? The, well, yes, the movie. I agree with you that in the film, it feels to me like he definitely wants Harry to be in the pensive and look at it and get some information in that Dumbledorean way where it's mm -hmm. like he knows what's going to happen. So might as well just do it. Mm -hmm. I In the book, yes, it does come off like, well, Harry, it's only natural that you're going to want to do that. And, you know, I left quickly and I must have not, you know, shut the cabinet tightly enough. And I think there's an argument to be made to be made, Mary, on on your thinking, which is like Dumbledore closes the cabinet of the pensive before he knows that Harry is there. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like it's just very purposeful. And for the fact that Dumbledore says, yeah, na Harry, of course, naturally, you're going to want to look in there. It's, it's curiosity. Curiosity isn't a sin. It's what we do and how we respond to the curiosity and, and the knowledge that we get that, that can be troublesome, right? 
I still kind of feel like Dumbledore wants Harry to like to look at the pensieve with a purpose. Mm-hmm. The question is, how did he know that Harry, how how did he know that Harry would look at it? Number one, aside from just intuition, but number two, how did he know that Harry would get the right memory? Right? Because is Dumbledore looking at that memory before? Harry enters the room? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And here's what I think. I think he was looking at it to see if he missed something about Carcroft. Because that's the initial one that we jump into. Is with yeah. Carcroft and Barty Crouch. And then, of course, it goes into Barty Crouch Jr. But Ludo Bagman is there, too. So what I find very interesting is these first two memories are two people who are, are three people who are integrally involved in the... Triwizard Tournament, now they've lost Barty Crouch Jr. These might be his only memories where Barty Crouch is in it. Yeah. So I think that it makes sense that of all the things swirling around in this pensieve, that that is what is up. You know, the funny thing is, Mary, we're 30 chapters into this book now, right? And this is the first chapter where I'm like, okay, this is where the story is getting going. I mean... And I, there, there seems to be two different worlds... Well, two different stories colliding in this one book. And I think that's probably why, number one, it's so big. But number two, uh, it feels a tad disjointed. In the f- the movie, it is far more disjointed. Yes. In the movie. I think the book does a better job. But I still feel like the tasks and everything are the fun we Hogwarts young kid book. Mm-hmm. And from here on out, this is when the story that the author wanted to tell actually gets going. But I love this because I think that Goblet of Fire, I agree, I would agree with you. I think that there's two things. And people ask me, you know, I want to hurry up and kind of start the series, but I don't have time for everything. First off, I say, foolish. <laughs> you need to go through it all. Please. Foolish mortal. But um, when it comes to Goblet of Fire, you know, it's a substantially different size book compared to the first three. And mm-hmm. I remember when Blake was first going through this series, I said, honestly, you can watch the fourth one you can watch movie four because all you pretty much need to know is he's back (laughs) like Voldemort comes back that's really what you need to know out of four yes as we as diehard fans we are gonna like pick out things that are super duper important but really the purpose of four is Voldemort comes back but I will say that I think that this is also the end of Harry's innocence as a child who is new in this wizarding world. And I love that we as fans of the wizarding world who want everything off the trolley. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't just give me a chocolate frog, anything off the trolley. trolley yes. Everything. I want to be here. I want the, I I'll want the take butter the lot. We are Potter. Okay. We will take the lot. We want to be doing all of these things. And so Do we need all of these different trials? Is it important to know that Harry can, you know, ask for his broom while fighting a dragon? No. In the grand scheme of things, no. Does it show his bravery? Yes. Does it show his maneuverability on the broom? Yes. But I think that this is the author's last chance to give us, wee, Hogwarts, I love magic moments. Yes. Before Harry has to mature before Harry sees death, before Voldemort is back. Uh, You know, this is the last book uh, that I even remotely recommend people read to young people Mm -hmm. uh, because of Cedric's death. This is a really, really big undertaking. Hashtag spoilers. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's a really big undertaking to go through this and to get to know these characters and to understand children can now die in this universe yeah. and how fragile this life is. So to me, we go from these joyous Yule Ball and fun little moments. We get so many more aspects of magic. We get to meet people from different lands with magic. We get a friggin' uh, stone basin that magically can hold onto your memories like Siri. Yeah. I mean, it is unbelievable how much of this magical world is inside this. I almost feel like this book adds so much more color to the to the wizarding world that this could um, really, really be up there with opening our our eyes to the wizarding world as much as Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. You know, these this these hundreds of pages, this is for us who love Hogwarts, who love uh, Diagonale, who love knowing there's more out there. So, but then after this... It's go time, baby. Yeah, Mary, it's probably not a coincidence that 
Harry sees death for the first time in this. Like, well, he obviously he sees, he sees his mother's death. So I know all you nerds out there are probably screaming at us about that. I get it. But he's going to see death as a young adult I mean, for the he didn't first time. technically see it and comprehend it, henceforth why he couldn't see right. the Thestrals. Exactly. That's what I'm getting at. Like, yes, technically he saw it, but Death happened let's all, in front of him. Let's all be freaking humans here and understand that when he's... I mean, however, maybe he was at the crib looking the other way. <laughs> Whatever. He remembers a green flash. So what I'm getting at is, this is the let's first time who that... Knows, who knows if he's always had bad eyes? Harry's always going to... Didn't he, have baby glasses. This is, this is the actual first time that Harry's going to conceive of death in a way that he can actually perceive it and uh and and comprehend it. So that's why I'm that's why we're making that statement. Okay? So boom, there it is. Don't don't at us, okay? Harry is going to be able to conceive and perceive and comprehend death for the first time and I don't think it's a coincidence that using this cha- again, this chapter. This is a big one, man, because not only do we get a really cool storytelling device, but it opens up the world outside of Harry's perspective. And, and yeah. I know, I know you nerds are probably going to be like, well, what about when Harry went into the diary? Yes, but that is specifically about Hogwarts itself. This is one where Harry even recognizes, whoa, where am I? Yeah. Like this is This is not Hogwarts. This ain't Hogwarts. I mean, like it, it, it could be, but it ain't. Yeah, you know what's interesting too is that this is this chapter because it's on memories. It's dealing with adult stuff. Yeah, and you that's know? what I'm saying. This is when the world actually opens. You, you get an actual uh uh breadth or uh sight into how wizarding justice works, right? And we get a bit more of the scope of the severity and darkness that the Death Eaters and Voldemort had. I mean, yes, we've had it over our heads, you know, he killed my parents. We know how bad Voldemort is, you know, but aside from that, we spent chapter two with... Oh, Tom Riddle. So essentially mm-hmm. a little memory of a student. And then, of course, last book, book three, was really this whole thing with Sirius Black. So Voldemort has been this ghost figure, you know, kind of like how Hagrid says in in the first, uh, you know, he's just kind of floating around. Yeah. I still think he's out there. But when you see this, when you see Carcroft talking about and testifying about these terrible crimes that people have committed. Mm-hmm. And you're able to put it into that perspective. We've all seen movies with juries. We've probably, many of us have been on a jury. You know, that uh, adults it up. That really makes this more real world. That it's not just this boogeyman of Voldemort. That there are other people, just like the ones who were at the Quidditch World Cup, who are doing bad things still. And who are this adamant that what they are doing, they will continue to do, and they will be rewarded yeah, for it. Yeah, it certainly gives, it it gives, uh, I, one of my favorite things about Star Wars The Last Jedi, uh, oh no, well, sorry, I, I apologize, Star Wars The Force Awakens. One of my favorite things about that is when Rey speaks to Han Solo and says, you knew Luke Skywalker, I thought he was a myth. And Han Solo says, yeah, it's, it was real. It's all real. The Force, the Jedi, the whole thing. Uh, I love that because it it deals in myth and it deals in perspective and what we do to figures that we've heard about. We've we turn these – George Washington, right? As Americans, we turn him into this almost – godlike figure right that he's transcended humanity yeah, because I, don't, I just know he was really tall for his age and he was six good, four i know which was really tall for that really age. tall for his age but we know we live in new england these houses are small so uh, voldemort at this point in the books ha, as you said mary has been on the outskirts yes they he did harry did have a, a little bit of a confrontation with voldemort in book one, and there was the Tom Riddle thing in book two, as you said. Book three, he's completely out of it. Book four, we're getting a sense of it, but it's only through dreams. But this right here is the first time we get an actual understanding and real truth to Voldemort, what he has done, the people he has affected, the people he's going to continue to affect, and the kind of wrath his followers are getting as a result 
of their actions following him, right? Bellatrix and Karkaroff and the whole thing. Like Bellatrix is, yeah, he's going to come back and you wait. We're going to, we're going to come back. It's going to be great. And, and Karkaroff is doing his thing. He's trying to do some deal making. And then you have a little body crouch here pleading for his life. And I think what is a horribly sad scene, uh, uh, Mother, yeah, like please, like the whole thing, and 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 Body Crouch Senior is trying trying to talk over him. I have no son. You're getting a perspective of the world outside of Harry's perspective that shows an actual truth, an actual repercussion of Voldemort. It makes Voldemort that much more real, and to be honest, that much more terrifying, because. Now he's not just on the outskirts circling, circling the wagons. He's in your face here. He's in, he's, in, he's in your face in a way that you can't help but have these kind of conversations and confront that person. And expanding that world uh, in a way that Harry gets to see and, through, and, and the, the reader through Harry's eyes gets to see the machinations of the mm. wizarding world and the deal making and yeah. like Moody being like, nah, just take his information and throw him back in jail. You know, there's a place for people like Cocker off and the whole thing and Cocker off trying to throw a snape onto the bus. And it, it's a fantastic chapter. Agreed. I have a question for you, Mary, about the Pensieve and how it works. Oh, okay. I'm ready for it. I love the description of the silvery light and that it's a cloud, of gas, but it's also kind of liquid. It, 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 it really gives the, the memories themselves. You can kind of perceive what that looks like Mm -hmm. in your own way. Mm -hmm. And it makes it really stand out, but the memories themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a copy of the memory or are you removing the memory? You're removing it. Yeah, but then how would you know to go back to, how would you know to go back to, like, uh, all right, let's consider like a, la- <laughs> let's consider it a library, right? Okay. Like, if you didn't know, like, if someone removed the knowledge of Harry Potter book four out of your brain, mm-hmm. took the memory out, how would you know to go to the library to go pick out Harry Potter book four? Oh, interesting. Right? So, mm-hmm. like, are you removing it? Is it copying it? And are you taking it out of your head and putting it into the thing so you can remember, but then how can you remember to reference it when you need to reference it? Oh. Um, well, I do know that Snape utilizes the pensive to, in the future, to remove his memories of trauma when he was a child so that it won't be shown to Harry accidentally during the occlumency lessons. So he actually takes it out and, you know, like puts it on a thumb drive, essentially, takes right. it out of his head, still knows it was there, but the interesting details of it are kind of stored elsewhere. Sure. It will be interesting to know, like, do you have the option to keep just a copy in the pensive, but still the original in your head? Or is it really to free up memory space? <laughs> yeah, like, is it, a, is it like a real, is it a real functioning thing where you are literally removing it? And, but then if you're really removing it, how can you reference it? How do you even remember that I it's think, there? No, I, I think to me, it's, it's a copy. But you do have the ability, because of what happens to Snape, I do think you have the ability to delete it off of your hard drive. <laughs> your internal So I hard think drive. you could do both. I think you can make a copy mm-hmm. and put it inside the pensive to you know go over later and fast forward and stuff. Because the other difficult thing, don't forget, is you can alter your memories. Because right, we, well, we learned that from slug, that. From slug So horn. you cannot trust everything that's in this pensive. Well, that's what I'm getting at, because, because Dumbledore... But again... If we're looking at it from the perspective of book four, as the author is writing it, she's writing it with the intent of being able to take the memory, put it into the thing so you can see it from an unbiased perspective. And as Dumbledore says, make connections and see patterns in an easier way. You know something super cool? What? So the history of the Pensieve um, predates actually creation of Hogwarts. Um, One of the legends says that the founders discovered the Pensieve half buried in the ground in the very spot that they they decided to have the school. And that is why they chose to erect their school there. And then subsequent headmasters of the school would utilize the Pensieve to deposit their, their memories and to help out other 
I like that. I like this. It, 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 I'm getting, uh, and I don't like going religious here, but I'm, I, you know, I, I'm getting, you know, St. Peter vibes from all of this. This is the rock upon which my church will be built. Mm. Uh, this is the, the rock upon which the school of Hogwarts will be built. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to take your memories and put it into the pensive, that means the, the rock upon which Hogwarts is built is the memories of all the wizards that have come before it. Yeah. Cause normally, I love that. Idea. Normally pensives are like really, really rare magical items yeah. and so rare and so powerful and very personal that witches and wizards who have pensives are traditionally buried with them like they're traditionally buried yeah, with their the wands yeah. but this one was special because it's the Hogwarts pensive and it's just handed down after each headmaster to essentially act like a resource yeah. you know here's here's the things you need to know when you become a headmaster like instead of having a manual just sit down for an hour and stick yeah. your head in the pensive and, and again I like this idea because you know a school is a source of knowledge it's a source of of history and uh, learning from mistakes and learning from success. I, I really I like see it all very this. much like a computer. Like I see that Dumbledore can go in and he can be like Tom Riddle and all search files with Tom Riddle. Carcroft. So to me, he went to the Pensieve right before he left and said, Carcroft, Barty Crouch. Mm. You know? Yep. And that's why it came up. Ludo Bagman, Barty Crouch. You know, if he had a Madame Maxine Barty Crouch, you know, he, he probably just finished that one. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> You know, like he's trying to go through and see the connections of who was with Barty Crouch. Yeah. Uh, but the, Mary, you brought it up earlier where you said you could change your memories or at least alter them. And again, we have to look at this in the context in which it was written. Right. The author, I don't think, knew necessarily yet that you could alter memories at this point mm -hmm. um just like in the same way that i don't think she knew thestrals pulled the carriages necessarily that's fine um we so don't... but let, let's just look at it from that perspective how can we trust any information from the pensive and how can we trust that it as dumbledore says is an unbiased you know uh, Wait, I thought you just told me to pretend that I don't know they can change things. Yes. So how, if we don't know that, mm -hmm. okay, how can we trust? I'm going to take the memory out of your brain here, okay? okay. How can we trust Free that- Free memory space. Delete. Okay. How can we trust that the Pensieve is giving you an accurate depiction of history? Because, and because not, these... not because, not because mm -hmm. you can't alter it with your brain, but because everybody remembers everything differently, right? So let's take one example- some person I, I have an answer for you okay go ahead so these are whose memories Dumbledore yes but are we seeing them physically through Dumbledore's eyes or are we watching it like a TV show we're watching it like a TV show okay so even though these are Dumbledore's memories and if right now Goblet of Fire we don't have the foreknowledge that memories can be altered mm -hmm. we are watching a, f a recording of what happened it's kind of like that show Love is Blind on Netflix that I've been watching. <laughs> you know, when these Love people go about their day. This is the worst show It is ever. so bad. It is so bad. Please do not watch it. Um, <laughs> but they go home and then they have to watch the show. Oh, brutal. And then they see, ooh, I did, ooh, I did see it that way. Or, wow, that was not what I thought it was. When you are able to see it, not through your own eyes, not yeah. your own your own head, but actually like a recording of it, mm -hmm. you, you can't, it's, it's not how you remembered it. It but, is, to me, this is hashtag facts. Like this was what happened. This is the ring cam. Okay, you can't you can't yeah, go wrong. I agree that this is we're we're throwing the red flag out. We're reviewing the play. hardcore evidence. Man. Totally agree. The problem is the idea is that it's based on Dumbledore's memories. Yes, but if it's Dumbledore's memory, which is fine, how how is it possible that? The memory isn't influenced by Dumbledore's interpretation. Because this isn't influenced. It is literally a recording of what happened. He's not having a monologue with Jim Dale's voice. Wow, I really disagree. Moody is rude. What a pretentious little person. Mm. You know, whatever. No, it's this is just the actual recording. This is as 
truth so, as right, it can so, be. So then it's not a memory. It's just... It's a recording. It's a recording. It is... See, I just find that hot. I find that hot to accept because your brain, it makes interpretations at all times. Every second of every but day. But this isn't in his brain. Yeah, but it is because he's taking it from his brain, from his memory. Blake, it's not from his point of view. I, I agree with you. I, I hear that. But the mechanics and the verbiage that he's is used. He's just taking the ring cam footage. From the day. No, no, I hear you. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not saying I disagree with you. I just, it's hard for me. It's like, so you, it, the, what you're saying is as a person, there are two spaces or two. When you dream, do you dream where you can actually see yourself or do you dream from first person? I think I dream first person. Interesting. I think I dream first. I think. I mean, I never really. I will pay attention to that from now on, but I don't think I dream third I person. You dream third person? I see myself. Really? I dream like I'm in a pensive. That's banana land. Really? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I'm not looking out of my eyeballs. See, I'm looking I out. See I, think, I think I'm looking out of my eyeballs. When so I... maybe it depends how you dream. Maybe your pensive memories are dependent upon how you dream. Yeah. I, so I guess... In dreams, we enter a world that is entirely our own. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Mary, that is good. Nerd! Good job. All right. Well, I mean, listen, we, we can go back and forth on this the, the entire time. I would actually love to hear what you nerds have to say about this and your interpretation of it. The way that I'm looking at it is you're, you're taking a memory from somebody, and no matter what, your brain is an inter- – you're, you're like – no matter how you see it, your brain is interpreting it some way. And your interpretation of an event can be wildly different than somebody else's. And if Mary is correct and it's just the ring cam, then that means your brain is storing an unbiased, unfettered, and completely in- completely free of her interpretation version of events. Because you're accessing it from your brain. So then that would lead me then to believe, can wizards do this? Can wizards actually have memories that are, you know, is that part of being a wizard, right? So there are, there's just a a larger conversation here that I think we could, we could go down to. And, and this is kind of the problem with the Pensieve and in the same way that the, the Marauder's map is kind of a problem. And even the time turner is kind of a problem because these magical artifacts, while awesome and they serve the story in which they're being brought out Mm -hmm. uh, in the specific way that the story needs them to be brought out in order to facilitate the plot. These magical artifacts are really powerful. I mean, particularly the Marauder's map, right? Because if Harry had the Marauder's map in this whole thing. He would, I mean, the whole thing would be over. Body Crouch Jr. Body Crouch Jr. That's it. Mad Eye Moody stuck in the same spot the entire time. The entire time. time. And and Body Crouch Jr. was walking around. Was there a house elf that brought extra food? Where Was there a bathroom in that little chest? My guess is no. My guess is no. Maybe there's a special little, um, you know, spell to clean it. Diaper spell. So, Depends. Uh, what I'm getting at Depensio. is... Depensio. Depensio. <laughs> Removio. Wipeio. Fabrizio. Janitorio. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I think there's a lot here, and the, the Pensieve, I think, can get the author in trouble, just the same way that the other magical artifacts can get her in trouble. And I guess, Mary, where is the Marauder's map in all of this right now? Like, I don't remember there being any kind of... Mention because at the end of um, Azkaban, Lupin gives it back to Harry and says, "You know, I'm your t- I'm not I'm not your teacher anymore. I have zero guilt in giving this to you. Here you go." Where is the Marauders map? In all Give me this? a moment to remember. Very good question. And and I ask not because like oh I forget, but I I just I I don't think there's a mention of it in this book at all. 
And if that's the case. No, I think Moody has it. Faux Moody. I'll get back to you on it. And it might just be because we've now been not reading it as much as we were supposed <laughs> like we, we're not yeah, we haven't read it in a while I, and i and i get you but i'm just saying like the fact of the matter is that's an important thing that's something that i would i would pick up on and if i don't remember it then i i don't think that it has been necessarily or explicitly laid out oh wait no because he sees bartimus crouch stealing um potions ingredients I don't think that they have a junior in it. I think because Barty Crouch is like here and doing stuff. Yeah. Um, he doesn't think it's it's anything uh, out of the ordinary, for example. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then it wouldn't make sense to him just to see like Mad-Eye Moody in his office. Keeping in mind, Harry is now 14. Not really. He doesn't keep tabs on every single person. He's got the Yule Ball. He's got the Triwizard Tournament. I think he's able just to kind of like brush it off. When he does check Moody's office, Moody is there. Mm -hmm. If he sees Barnabas Crouch, he just thinks it's senior. Uh, How do you think, do you like how the movie does the Pensieve better? Or do you like how the book does it better? In terms of the memories themselves, like, you know, there's a big difference in the, in the movie and how the pensive is is used, right? Uh, well, I'm sorry, not how it's used, in how, in the memories that are brought up through the pensive. I will say that one of my favorite things about this chapter is the humanizing of Barty Crouch Jr. Mm. Versus in the movie. In the movie, he's the same adult actor doing his little tongue flick thing. <laughs> You know, yes. I saw that. Black, you know, like, <laughs> wait, what does he do? Get a bib, you know. <laughs> Get a bib. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Whereas in this memory, he is, you know, a young teenager. Obviously, Bellatrix Lestrange is proud of what she just did. Yes. And you get the feeling from this that this kid signed up for the wrong game of truth or dare. He does not in this chapter come off like. You know, the the character that we see in the movies where he pretends he's good and then all of a sudden he tries to run away and does a little tick, tongue flick and yes. sorry, father, I've been bad all along. In this chapter, he is sobbing, father, please, mother, please. I didn't mean to do it. And But is it an act? That's the thing. I don't think so. And this is, in my opinion, why I am going to die on this die on this theory that Barty Crouch Jr. is the best Death Eater to fool Dumbledore for an entire year. And my favorite thing about this, because we don't get a lot about Bellatrix Lestrange, her backstory. Right. What if this is the moment that little baby Barty Crouch Jr., badly influenced by his peers, gets into something. Maybe he doesn't even physically do the Cruciatus curse. Maybe he's just there. He's the lookout. He's the he's essentially the Peter Pettigrew of the bad kids club. Sure. You know, he's just kind of following them around, realizes this is a bad lot. I don't want to be here. And then his dad sentences him to Azkaban for life. And that's what and what if him. that is what turns him? And where if he's in Azkaban with Bella and she's saying, Listen, man. See? See, you know, you know who's always gonna have your back? Voldemort. You want you wanna get power back? You wanna be the strongest wizard? And you know, you know that Sirius was there having to listen to Bella, watching Big Bird goes to Japan, then he's got crying <laughs> Barty Crouch Jr. Big Bird goes to Japan. He wants to watch Peter Pan because he wants to be a little kid for the rest of his life. Yes. You know, like, oh man. But that's what he had. He, I, I, I feel like this is a defining moment of why Barty Crouch Jr. became so bad and so bent. And I'm going to do everything I can to be the best at being the worst. I am going to be hmm. the strongest Death Eater. I like this take. Right? I like, like this take. How humanizing is this chapter for him? Yeah, and that would eventually give you, it would give reason and cause to why he kills his father because yes. F you, I'm finally better than you. Look what you did to me and I'm and I'm still out. But then again, how, again, hashtag spoilers, how do we explain then the plan between the mother and Barty Crouch Jr. and how they switch bodies and the whole thing? Because Barty Crouch Sr. is sick of hearing his wife cry. Sick of it. 
She's like, listen, man, I'm going to die and never see my son again. And it's all your fault. Please let him come here on house arrest. Let's figure this out. And then that's what happens. Huh. I do. The, I think that's his. I think Barty Crouch Sr. brings Browdy Crouch Jr. home as a I'm sorry to his wife. Yeah. I, I and I I think there's I think there, I, to me there is no love when he says you are no son of mine I feel that I feel that in my bones and I think that 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 is what has made Barty Crouch the most I, dangerous I, but, death eater. Well, part of me also thinks that when when senior junior. says all when senior says junior. all that, okay, we got to say it in the Cockroft voice yeah. Barty Crouch Junior <laughs> when when senior says you know son of mine and and he starts talking over him and it's like he and, and senior is intentionally speaking louder and more discern like more discerning and and not discerning um in a more disconcerting tone um uh, one where it's authoritative um to me that all feels like i got to save my own butt here because if i don't save <clears throat> excuse me if i don't save my own butt here then my career is over and I have to make it look like I'm coming down hard and not going soft on my own kid, right? And and the more that I talk about this chapter, Mary, the more that I love this chapter. Yeah, I know. The more that I love it because the other part of the conversation that has to happen here is if your theory is correct that this is when Body this Crouch- this is what Sirius thinks. Sirius says, I don't think he actually did it. Sirius, who spends time with him in Azkaban, does say, I don't really know if he did it or not. Yeah, and if Sirius says that, then... And it is, um, it's the cowl, it's it's the twins. You know the twins that ends up coming to Hogwarts later? Oh, the, yeah, It's yeah. them two plus Bellatrix, then Barty Crouch. And now, granted, Barty Crouch Jr., when he gets his Veritas serum at the end of this book, just lays it all out that he's bad, but I don't think he actually says, yes, I did it. I... I crucioed the long yeah. bottoms. To me, I the think caros. he was. That was who it is. The yes, the cows. Yeah. Um, I think that he physically didn't. To me, reading this right now, once again, I might be proven wrong <laughs> in the end. Um, but how interesting would it be if he didn't do it? This pushes. <laughs> Doesn't him matter up. if you're wrong, Mary. It just it, as long no, as it suits your argument, that's fine. No, I'm just in, in saying Mary it's and Blake an interesting... Media, we we firmly believe in that. <laughs> Any take is fine as long as it serves our argument. <laughs> I'm just saying it's very interesting if he didn't do it. And if this is what pushes him so far compared to other Death Eaters that, um, you know, we're always bad to the bone. Because granted, Voldemort says, like, you are my best Death Eater. So it's kind of interesting because it's like, okay, but but obviously torturing the Longbottoms with a bunch of other kids wouldn't have made him crown jewel. You know what I mean? So if that was his only, quote, crime... To get him sent to Azkaban, mm -hmm. why would Voldemort say you're the best? Versus, what if this made him so mad, so evil to the core, that this made Voldemort say, oh, you've got daddy issues too? Yeah. Okay, I can I, work with this. I feel like, this. yeah, we're good here. We're on I the same level. I can work with this, baby. All right. And, and, and Mary, uh, piggybacking on that, and this is where I was going with all of this, is if your theory, is, if your take is correct, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say your take is correct. That also brings into the question here, is Voldemort a better father figure to, se to Junior than Senior? And if that's yep. the case, yep. how messed up mm -hmm. is that? Think about that. He gets told you're the best. You're the only one that could do this for me. I'm, I'm going to trust you with the biggest task. He gets all of the respect, the accolades, that he wishes he had from his own father, mm. from Voldemort. Oh, be oh, I mean, that is, that's something right there. And here's another thing, too. On top of all of this is this parallel, or mirroring, if you will, of, of Junior, but with Neville at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because Junior loses his father, by choice, like his. You mean his father loses him by choice? Yeah, yeah. Like his father goes away. Barty Crouch by, Senior by, pushes his son away. Correct. If if and, Barty, you're saying under the guise that Barty Crouch Junior is innocent of this act of the Cruciatus Curse against yes. the Longbottoms, 
Yes, Barty Crouch Sr. is the one that that makes this choice. Right, and but at the same time, and connected to it, is the long, long bottoms feet. Neville has parents. They're there. They're just bananas. They're on freaking Mars because of what happened to them, right? So you have these two kids that went down these different paths that have these parents that aren't there really anymore. And they serve, I think, as mirrors of each other of what could be and what couldn't be, right? Uh, and so you, you lay all this together. And I'm not saying that's the most accurate take on the whole planet, but when you start thinking about it, like I think there's something there to it. I mean, I'm not as strong on your idea as I am on mine, mm-hmm. but I appreciate your theory on it. I will also tell you this. I feel like Barty Crouch Jr., if he did this, if he actually was... Uh, guilty of the Cruciatus curse against the Longbottoms, mm-hmm. he would have owned up to it at this point with Bella, with his buddies. Because for him to be so proud to be Voldemort's number one, mm-hmm. I really do. I think if he was truly bad to the bone already by that point, he would have fessed up to it because sure. I feel like he is a very proud person. He fesses up to it later. He's pumped. I am his most proud Servant, I am his most proud, uh, most uh, his top follower. Like he yeah. loves that. Interesting, and because w- Bellatrix is proud of it, she sure. doesn't stand down. She doesn't say no. I didn't do it. So I truly think, in this book, he did not commit the Cruciatus curse. He spent time in Azkaban. His dad had one last shot to redeem himself, and he said no. And that is when Barty Crouch went full Death Eater. Sure. Signed, sealed, delivered. This chapter lays so much groundwork. And, and again, we're, I, I think it, it's just coming to us as we're talking about it. But another part of the groundwork that's laid here, too, obviously, is Bellatrix. That's that's what, that's something Ooh, that is... I had just another idea. What? You know how you were just saying how like interesting it is for Neville Longbottom, who doesn't really necessarily have like an active father figure in his life. Sure. Same could be said for Harry. And Barty Crouch Jr. knows how to capitalize on that. Oh, 100%. Harry doesn't have a father figure in his life. He's got yep. sweet little Hagrid, but he, let's be real. Hagrid is more like, you know, a cousin. Sirius um, is on the lamb. Sirius, yes. Sirius is gone. Yep. He doesn't have his dad. He doesn't even have Remus Lupin. He's got nobody. So how interesting that Mad-Eye Moody, a.k.a. Faux Moody, Barty Crouch Jr., knows I can capitalize on this child who's impressionable. I was his age when I was let down looking for any source of a a you know male figurehead mm-hmm. who would have my back, who would encourage me, who would challenge me, who would be there for me to say, yeah, but you're really you're really fast on a broom. I know you can figure this out. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I'm going to stick up for you. Very interesting. I'm going to stop your bullies from bullying you. How amazing. And I wouldn't put it past this brilliant Barty Crouch Jr. to know exactly what he's doing playing into this um, needing a father complex of yeah. Harry Potter. Yeah. Well, as I was saying earlier, great, brilliant take, Mary. Really. Oh, that's good stuff. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I think this chapter, again, starts laying some more groundwork for a lot of the things that are about to come. Number one, I think it lays out Bellatrix and introduces to us to her as a character and the kind of person that she is and what we're going to eventually get into in, later on in, in later books. Uh, but it also introduces us to the idea that I think Dumbledore is starting to see there are things that are happening around him now that are bigger than what he probably in originally thought. Well, think about it. When this was all happening, they thought Voldemort's gone. Right. And now I think he sees, whoa, hold on a second here. We did not tie up the loose ends. Th- this is not just, oh, you know, this is, we Hogwarts, right? This is like, I don't have my hands wrapped around this whole thing. And you get that sense when he's talking to Harry about the sky, when he's like, I have some theories, but I don't know. I, I like I, either it's when he gets really angry, or you know there's or he's close to you. I'm still working on it. I'm I'm trying to figure it out, and you can tell that he's in, but not. He doesn't have his whole hand around the situation mm-hmm. because he's reading the Muggle newspapers, right? He's reading the he's reading about Frank Bryce. Frank Bryce poor, and the whole rest thing. in peace. And you can we should see, have had this book dedicated to poor Frank. I know. <laughs> you can see that he's. He steps ahead of everybody else, but I don't know if those steps ahead 
Does uh, he have time for this with all of his knitting that he does, his traveling? All the Kelly, all the oh Kelly gosh. Clarkson, all the cake. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's definitely listening to the T, T- Swift album. Though, oh, he's figuring you, this out. you you know you know he's got 1984 on on mm-hmm. oh, the new one? new one. Yeah, yeah. The, okay, the new one. Uh, fair it's enough. me. He he goes. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. He goes back to 1984 when he wants to relive his young days. I I understand. Okay. Um, part of all of this, right, is the fact that the the ministry is is being like, nah, there's no connections here. It's all said. Like what? Like we're not. They're not paying attention. To, nah, we're we're good here. Like yeah, these are all just with Bertha Jorkins and and the whole thing. They're just looking at it like, yeah, we're all set. We put this behind us. We're moving on. There's there's no problems with with uh, Voldemort here, mm-hmm. which eventually that's a real problem in book five, and and then certainly in book six, obviously, right? So all of that groundwork is being laid right here, right here, and to add to all the distrust is the fact that Ludo Bagman is brought into these trials as a person that's being convicted yet because he's famous and because he's Ludo Backman and he's the Quidditch player and the whole thing. Everyone's like, ah, Ludo's just being stupid. He yep. don't know. And it- I love this as a red herring to continue to have Ludo right, in right. here. Um, I find it very interesting. I wonder if Snape knows how dirty Karkaroff was. Oh, and don't forget there's Snape. There's Snape. Yeah. He's totally a death eater. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Like, did Snape ever hear that from anybody? Yeah, would be like, dude, Cockerel have tried to throw you under the bus. And like, bus. how does he feel Hardcore. now that he's in Hogwarts? Being like, you? Yeah. I remember what you did 13 years ago. Yep. Oh, how can you be buddies? Like, you ain't buddies no more. I would buddy that guy in a heartbeat. Listen, buddy. <laughs> Take a hike. Mm. If I buddy you, you're dead. How interesting... What do you? Uh, uh, no, and I got I, that'll be saved. That'll be saved for my different perspective. Actually, okay, fair <clears> enough. <throat> um, Snape, you, you brought Snape up here, Mary. Yeah. Continuing, the author does these little things with you, where it's like you think that's. It's so funny. She is out and out telling you Snape is not the problem. Snape is not an issue. Yeah. Yet, as a reader, you are still thinking. That Snape could be an issue. Yeah. I love this. I love this so much. Mm-hmm. And I, I I think that's partially why these books work so well. Because Snape is a major figure in these books, but he doesn't, he's not the central figure. Obviously, we, that's Harry and the trio, right? But Snape is a pillar of these books. And she tells you from the beginning, Snape is okay, but you, the reader, distrust that. And it's not any contextual evidence. There, there's no textual evidence for you to be like, None. Snape sucks. I mean, even Harry then goes on to question it again. Right. And what's crazy is that Voldemort is totally okay. And not Voldemort. Dumbledore is totally fine outing Neville Longbottom's secret, being like, Psh, just don't tell him I told you. Mm-hmm. And yet, he keeps Snape's secret. We could have saved ourselves a lot of problems, friends, if Harry was just in on the secret right. that Snape loved his mom, he promised he would take care of him forever and ever and ever, and, and that is essentially why he's going to be a good guy through and through till the mm-hmm. day he dies. Right. Why doesn't Dumbledore just say, Snape, I know you're embarrassed. I know you made me promise not to tell anybody, but like, this kid, this kid keeps thinking you're guilty, and uh, you guys could actually probably have a really good relationship. If you just, <laughs> if I could just tell him yeah. that you're looking out for him this whole time, you're technically acting like his godfather could, should, would do if he yeah. wasn't an outlaw. Can I just tell him? Can I just tell it's him? It's an interesting, uh, well, again, uh, this is one of those things. But he can't because Dumbledore wants the long game. He wants to keep using Harry as well, a lamb. Well, yeah, I, and that's the thing. I Well, I was just going to say, Mary, we ran into this in Rings of Power where it was like, a, a, a major problem was solved when two of the characters just sat down and had a conversation <laughs> and you were like, wow, that's refreshing. <laughs> so part of it is, well, the books need to keep going. 
right? And the books need the reveal. Uh, but she totally lays the... She knew. She knew long game. Book one. I'm going to have this mystery about Snape. Absolutely. So she couldn't show her cards this early. Absolutely. But if you wanted to take textual evidence to support the argument, I think that would be... Dumbledore knows that Harry has to be the lamb and he has to get Harry to go through his life thinking that he is the one that's making the sacrifice and not, you need to do this, Harry. He's known Harry's been a horcrux since the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, and now with Harry being like, oh, and now my scar hurts. Okay, like conf- confirmation. The Chamber of Secrets showed Dumbledore that Voldemort made horcruxes. Yes, but my interpretation, and the only reason why I bring this up is because we just watched um, The Half-Blood Prince Yes, uh, a couple of days ago. And it shows you how much of how, how, how often we watch these films, ladies and gents. Uh, we just watched it on a whim. And in that, no, it wasn't a whim. I've already been watching all the previous I, I know, five, but, and you guys finally hung out with me well, when I was ready for six. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I guess what I'm getting at is there's a scene when Harry touches the ring, and the ring flips out. And and he does his little neck thing. Yeah, and Dumbledore does a double take. But that's movie. That's movie. And they have to do these things just like the Barty Crouch Jr. lip thing, the the tongue thing. Harry Potter in the movies has to do his little neck, uh, Voldemort stretch my neck thing. But I think what what book two did, what Chamber of Secrets did, is it told Dumbledore Voldemort made Horcruxes. Mm-hmm. Fact. Done. And now Harry's saying, I'm having these dreams and my scars hurting. Sure. All right, buddy. Let's go time. There's more. And you you are it. Fair. So I, again, the textual evidence would suggest. And that he knew du- it has to happen when, like, you kill someone. Sure. And Harry was right there. And it would suggest that Dumbledore knew that Harry needed to be sacrificed, but Harry had to make the choice himself. It couldn't be a thing that Dumbledore gave all the information. It had to come from Harry in order for it to be the thing. Right, so I think there are two things working against the fact that there just wasn't a conversation to be had yeah. <laughs> um, for for all of this. Um, bringing that back to Lily, though, because Dumbledore's the only person who knows the uh, the prophecy. Well, the one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born. Um, you know, like they're going to have to, one of them's going to have to die. Yes. The, the other the one can't will live. Do it. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Stats of nerds. We know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and this even kind of ties into what I'm about to say, Mary, and that is Dumbledore has this really important line. And I th- I'm not sure how... Um, how well analyzed this line is. And, and when I read it, it just, it stood out to me, which is when he is talking about Harry and Voldemort and he is saying that it, what connects them is the failed curse. This is a really important line. And these words I think are chosen very carefully, right? Because they're talking about the sky, why it hurts, the whole thing. And it's not that Harry was special. It's not that Harry did something to make him Harry freaking Potter. It was a curse that Voldemort tried against Harry and it failed. That, like, it is not a triumph, it is a failure that connects these two, right? It's not that Harry is this big special wizard. He's just a kid. Mm -hmm. He didn't do anything to be special. It just so happened that this curse failed and that is what connects these two. See what I'm saying? Okay. I just find that line to be fascinating because we look at Harry as the boy who was chosen, the boy who lived, but Harry didn't actively do anything to live. 
it was a curse that failed. Yeah, that Dumbledore already had an inkling about. Dumbledore said, you know, I guessed you might have been, you know, uh, an issue back when I saw the scar on your forehead. Yes. I guessed that it was a connection between the two of you when I saw that scar. I remember he's asked by by um, McGonagall to get rid of it. And he's like, no, sometimes they're useful. Mm-hmm. So I just, I, I, the more that I talk about this chapter, the more that I love this chapter. Uh, for all the different reasons that we've spoken about, uh, you know, for the fact that the, you know, th- that the pensive itself is like this really old artifact that is beyond Dumbledore's, you know, uh, powers or knowledge. It's older than him. There's runes on it that Harry didn't understand. Like uh, the, all the layers with uh, Voldemort and, and Junior and Harry and it, it, Moody. All it, it's all just spectacularly done, and it's wrapped up and tied together through a, a, a device that in any other world, I think you'd look at it and say, come on, get out of here. That ain't going to work. Or that, but in the magical world, it's good and it makes sense. And it allows uh, storytelling to happen in a way that you would never normally be able to get it. Even things like Moody having both of his eyes and recognizing that he has both of his eyes or learning that he lost part of his nose Mm -hmm. because uh, of what happened to him with with one of the other Death Eaters. Like you would never be able to get that information anywhere else other than other than through the pensive through exposition. And I, I, I just I can't I can't think of another of another better expository device. In storytelling, in, in storytelling, I just can't. You know what's so cool is you know we as viewers of these shows we have seen Dumbledore's office a million times by now. This is Harry's second time, his second time being in this office. Isn't that wild? Yeah, that is wild. And um, you know this is really where he does. He wants to have this one-on-one conversation with Dumbledore, and this really does change the evolution of their relationship, seeing each other more as equals, trying to help solve this problem together as they both go on this journey of trying to defeat Voldemort. And I love when Harry goes in; we get to revisit Fox and seeing the sword and the sorting hat and all these things that have been monumental in his younger years, Mm -hmm. and yet now he's going to be given this giant. The giant weight of like, all right, it's time to be an adult. Here we go with the pensive. Yeah, and that there's also another thing that happens in this chapter too when he's looking at the sort of Gryffindor and everything. After he sees a sort of Gryffindor, the the internal monologue of it, his own point of view was saying, oh, it reminded him of that time when he got stuck into that, uh, into that diary and he relived all these memories. Mm-hmm. And it the book just expects you to remember that because if you don't the book's like sorry yeah you messed up like if you don't know you don't know it it gives you an opportunity to have the information but you don't understand the weight of the information unless you remember what happened you know what's interesting is harry's never asked to put his memories into the pensive Hmm, interesting. He's never asked whether it be his baby memories, you know, of his parents dying. He's never asked about having um, the the labyrinth and Cedric's death replayed so that someone else could view it. So that hmm. vo- that Dumbledore could say, can I see what happened? Can I see um, the potion, the spell that was used to recreate him? Mm-hmm. And granted, Harry goes through some pretty hard stuff. So I guess saying like, hey, can I just borrow your memory for a second or make a little thumb drive copy mm. so I can deal with this a little bit more? But I find that very interesting. Maybe you're mm. not supposed to use it in underage wizards. Mm. Good. Just kind of like Veritaserum. Which, by the way, why wouldn't they just use Veritaserum on the on the prisoners? Like I know that they eventually do that to to, to Junior at the end of the book, right? I get it. Mm-hmm. But why wouldn't they do that to Kakarov and Great question, Blake. And to, to Junior. Like Great when they're question. in jail. Like, again, the book has to happen, right? Yes. The the story has to happen. So there are things that are put but but let's just say You know that, what it is? Yeah. All things being equal, yeah. it goes to show you that the truth isn't what really matters, mm-hmm. right? What matters is 
they have somebody to blame. Mm -hmm. They have somebody to say, you did a thing. It doesn't matter if I know the truth of the thing, but I can blame you for the thing. So you have to go to jail. Mm -hmm. And it's not just jail. It's you have to be around all of those uh, you have to be like literally carried in by Dementors. Yeah. And you have to have your life sucked from you every single day. Like the way that Hagrid describes it, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you just, your life is just, it's pouring out of you. That is some intense stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, it, 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 I think it's a comment on on wizarding justice as opposed to finding actual justice. You know, it's also interesting too, because we've just gone back and forth. And as you've said, like we we're in this series all the time. This is the first time it's actually confirmed that Snape was a death eater. Interesting. Yes. And that's, that's right. Mm. That he was in fact a death, eater. which again, it goes back to show you that even though, even though the author is telling you straight up, yes, he was a death eater, but it's fine. The fact that you get the information that he was indeed a death eater, big deal. Mm -hmm. big deal because that it just sows that just just that much more doubt into you about about Snape and it allows you to make the judgment call which is why again that character works so well you are able to judge that character based off of your own interpretations through actions that he is doing but you're not being lied to mm -hmm. oh it's why it's so great. It really is. It really is. I think that's why this books, these books work so well. Let's um, wrap things up with the long bottoms. Okay. So we, of course, learn uh, that two characters who found out where Voldemort was, like these people were top-notch aurors, or, or sorry, Frank was a top-notch auror, mm -hmm. um, and they got cruciato for it. Mm -hmm. And now Neville just- cruciate. Couldn't... Yeah. You said cruciato. Uh, you know, I made a little Italiano. It's all good. <laughs> Maybe I need some pizza. <laughs> and- um. You know, we find out that this, of course, is why Neville lives with his grandmother, and he's never really brought it up to anybody before. Um, how do we feel about all this? About what? You know, Neville's secret coming to light for the readers, but also, also to Harry. And how does this change how we view Neville from here on out? Well, it certainly gives Neville more understanding. Like, oh, I'm sorry. It gives us more understanding of Neville and why his grandmother probably is the way that she is with him. I, I, again, I, I can't help but look at the texture of allowing a character to be without having to um, have them tell you what they are, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that, to me, is what good writing is. Let the story unfold. Let the backstory unfold. Don't tell me. And even though like you did get kind of told... You, it, it's not in a in a way that it's like, hey, you must know. It, it's it happens organically, yeah, and it makes Neville that much more of, of an actual character, more than just hey, funny Neville with the frog. You know, it's it's so interesting because um, I actually see this as bringing so much depth to Dumbledore's characters. He's talking about it because, um, you know. Yes, they were talking about Neville's parents at Dumbledore. His father, Frank, was an or just like Professor Moody. He and his wife were tortured for information about Voldemort's whereabouts after he lost his powers, as you heard. So they're dead, Harry said quietly. No, said Dumbledore, his voice full of a bitterness Harry had never heard before. Ooh, I love that. They're insane. They're both in St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. I believe Neville visits them with his grandmother during the holidays. They do not recognize him. The Longbottoms were very popular, said Dumbledore. The attacks on them came after Voldemort's fall from power, yeah. just when everyone thought they were safe. Those attacks caused a wave of fury such as I have never known. The ministry was under great pressure to catch those who had done it. Unfortunately, the Longbottoms' evidence was, given their conditions, none too reliable. Right. And again, this goes back to, I don't care about the truth. I just care about blaming somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wonder that edge, I wonder. Uh, that edge of bitterness. Yes. Like, okay, bitter mm -hmm. is a very intentional word, especially because it says that he's never heard from him before. Right. So, the 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 bitterness. So when somebody is bitter, 
that to me is anger. That is um, frustration. Uh, and there is no sense of kindness. There's no sense of like, um, I, I don't want to say forgiveness, but there's just, there's no softness to it. It's just bitterness. Mm-hmm. And, but it's also not remorseful either. And it's not looking at it through a lens of, oh, only if I could have. Do you think he's bitter towards himself? That, Everything. That he may have had the opportunities to protect the long bottoms, but didn't do it? Possibly. Like, did he send them out to go find their location, his location? Yeah. Did he tip them off? I think Voldemort's here. And obviously they were well loved. And now he has their only son yeah. here, knowing he's living essentially as an orphan, you yep. know, with not not popular, not treated well. And even Moody, real Moody, in Order of the Phoenix says, better dead than what happened to them. Yeah. So multiple people are essentially saying that this is like the worst life that you could be having. Yeah, interesting. And it's also interesting that Moody in the memory is saying, you know, I'd rather Karkaroff you know, go back to jail and get his life sucked out than be free for given information. Like that I think is a fate as bad as what is happening to the long bottoms mm-hmm. at that point. Right. So it's, it, you could see the sympathy and the empathy there from, from Moody where it's like better off dead, but go back to jail, get your life sucked out. So it's just, it's full of these contradictions in these, and, 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 and these, and this, these moral gray areas. It adds so much depth because, you know, in the next book in order of the Phoenix, Bellatrix, when she and the death eaters are trying to get the prophecy and Dumbledore's army is in the ministry of magic. She taunts Neville oh, so I much. Know. And she says, let's see how long long bottom lasts before he cracks like his parents. Oh, I, I, you know, Mary and I were having a conversation uh, with one of, with our son the other day, where he's like, you know, I kind of like when the bad stuff happens in in like a movie, and she's like, oh yeah, you like your dad, and I I got to tell you, I love that line, mm-hmm. I love that line, and not because I'm I'm I, I'm a you know a glutton for pain and punishment, but just because it's just such a great line, mm-hmm. and it's such an antagonistic line. It's such one of those things like that's a real character saying something real that you believe that they would say, and it shows you who they are. And because without lines like that, you can't get things to move forward. Mm-hmm. You can't create vulnerability. You can't create anger. You can't create hatred. Like you have to have stuff like that, and that's why I love it so much. Yeah, because it propels you into the story as opposed to telling you like, Oh, Bellatrix is bad. You know, like, Mm -hmm. Oh no, 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 no. She's going to say some stuff that will push, push the limit. And that is one of those lines. I love it. Love, 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 love. All right. Anything else you got for this chapter, my love? No, I don't. All right. You ready for the first different, (laughs) different perspective in about eight months. You ready? Yes. All right, here we go. Holy cricket. You're Harry Potter. I'm Hermione Granger. And you are... Hermione Krabs Jr. Junior! A bad day for you today, Junior, huh? No. Well, I mean... What do you mean? I mean, we, I mean, we were looking at, your mem- looking at memories over here, and you got... Your dad did did you pretty dirty. Yeah, and I did him the same. Oh! oh. You know, I'm living my best life right now. Man. Why do you say that? I do have a pebble in my shoe, okay? Oh. But I'm living my best life. Okay. I'm... I'm the best. I am the best Death Eater ever. You're pretty good. Even Voldemort said so. Agreed. Killed my dad. Check. Big deal. I mean... Patricide is one of those things. (laughs) Let me tell you, (laughs) this has been a goal of my... This has been on my vision board. (laughs) I made a vision board. Uh, Uh They they did arts and crafts in Azkaban. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Was this pre or post Big Bird in Japan? Uh, So after the sixth viewing of it, um, you know, I asked, could we please have an extracurricular activity? Because I already know the lines. I know that Big Bird's going to eat the big plastic fish. Um, We know what happens. We know what happens. Sirius wouldn't stop 
complaining. So I asked for arts and crafts. He, all he wanted was Schindler's List. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. Got some arts and crafts. Got. Yeah, I'm actually very creative. Oh, really? I don't know if you knew this about me, but, you know, I'm an artist. I'm a thespian. Oh. Obviously. Well, well I, mean, I mean, hello, yeah. obviously. You're doing a good job with Thank the whole booty thing. I know. <laughs> I know. And, uh, You yeah. got that one little click, though. That one little thing. That, no, that... that's not real, man. That's just a, th- that's the movie version. Oh, right? okay. All right. Okay? Fair enough. That's not real me. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm all, I am flawless. Yeah. <laughs> A regular Tom Hanks. I am going to win all the Emmys. <laughs> so I made a vision board. And on that vision board, um, I had Voldemort giving me a hug. Uh-huh. Uh, number one pretend son award. Uh, yes. Um, I had get back at my dad, potentially kill him. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. Awesome. Love right. That. Love it. Live in a castle. Guess what I'm doing? <laughs> Living my best life. Living my best life. I uh, I wanted some more house elves. You know, yep. like I liked Winky. But, but you know, she whines too much. Now I've got a castle full of them, that making you food all the time, all cleaning your stuff, cleaning, cleaning up my chest. They yeah. don't know where all the Depends diapers are coming from. Depensio, they don't care. They don't care. <laughs> Living my best life. Uh, the one pebble. So yeah, okay. you know, did all these great things. Well, you got I'm one leg everybody. Right now. You got one leg, really. I mean, yeah, I guess so. So the pebble and the one foot I have. It's a big deal. Um. Harry Potter uh-huh, yeah. wants to talk privately with Dumbledore. Oh, you know what? Nothing good comes from that. We had a thing. Okay, I've worked really hard on this. Mm-hmm. I've worked really hard to be his go-to, to be his 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 person. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what he wants to talk about. Oh. I mean, maybe it's the third task. Maybe it is. You know, but what? why wouldn't he come to me? Uh, you gave him the idea about the I mean, I'm, I'm, I Honestly, like I am so nice to this kid. You did the whole broom like thing. Him. I kind of like him. Maybe I can make him switch. I mean, I know I'm pretty much to get to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but like, this is the best thing. Yeah. You know, because I'm, I'm obviously the best death eater. That yeah. like, I actually like having this kid like me. I wouldn't put it I like you. having this kid love me. You know and what I don't know why he thinks he can have another favorite professor. You know what it is? Tell me. You're the father that he never had. Yeah. That you that you wanted. And then you know what I'm going to do? What's that? I'm going to crush him like my dad. Oh! Except instead of Dementors, death. Yeah, that death thing. Oh, you're, you're really into death, huh? I'm so into death. I, I love that my name is Death Eater. Like, if I could just be called Death Death. Because <laughs> I don't know why there's an eater. Like, I like to eat. But I'm not sure if eating death would be good. Eating is much better than poly juice potion. That stuff tastes gross. Oh, yeah. Okay. No pumpkin juice chasers can make up for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the only thing. I'm actually, you know, I'm not necessarily worried. Like, he's probably just going to talk about a crush or something. Yeah. But I'm a little offended. Like, I thought we had a thing going on. I feel like I'm in the show Love is Blind, and he's also dating someone else in a different pod. Uh, you know, what's he thinking? He's a two timer, that kid. <sighs> No wonder why nobody likes him. I'm going to need to have some special one-on-one time with him and find out what's going on. Potter stinks. No, he doesn't. (laughs) He doesn't. Everyone's wearing them. them, uh... He actually smells really good. (laughs) He has good, good, uh, you know, cleanliness. I appreciate that about him. His hair, his hair's a little messed up. He doesn't stink. He's a little messy. Sure. You know, not as messy as his friend Ron. Oh, my God. Oh, that kid. That, That kid. He would not be a number one Death Eater, okay? No, he would be the opposite of, a, of the He'd number one. He'd be a Peter Pettigrew. I'll tell you what, <laughs> that jabroni that I have to hang out with can't even do his freaking job. Yeah, you got to cover up for him. So I love this. I love being in a castle. I'm going to get my, my award soon, number one Death Eater. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. going to get my hug from Voldemort because he can't give me a hug right now. He doesn't have a body. But when he does, yeah, that, that last moment, a castle, number one Death Eater. Yeah. Killed my dad, and the last thing that I want is my hug. Is, you are manifesting this hug. Yeah, man. I never knew that you were such a big manifester. You know? Are, is, I, there's a lot of things you don't know about me. What's I'm the, artistic. <laughs> I'm a thespian. What's I, the didn't, one? I didn't do the Cruciatus Curse, but it's my favorite now. It's yeah, my what, favorite. Yeah, I know, because he. I'm sure. I'm sure. Your dad did you pretty dirty. I don't blame you for loving, yeah. uh, for, for loving the Cruciatus Curse now, yeah. because that was your undoing, really. Yeah. But what is the number one thing that you write in your gratitude journal? I don't like, do that. You don't you don't do the journal. I don't do that. Oh, you see, I think you have to be repetitive. You have to repeat. No, I'm have- artistic and I have a vision board <laughs> in my Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom at the top of the stairs. You know you know where uh what's his name? The guy that liked to look at himself all the time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that guy, Gilderoy oh, Lockhart, Gilderoy. that guy, the guy with the two eyes. So, <laughs> you know, he had all those pictures of him. Yes. Instead, at the top of my stairs, mm-hmm. it's my vision board. Ah, okay. It's my vision board. Yeah, but that's going to be kept secret, though, because if somebody sees you hugging Voldemort in your vision board. They don't know what it means. That's going to be big problems. They don't know what it means. It's just a big black thing because he's going to do it in his cape. I'm going to give him an outfit. <laughs> Arts and crafts. I'm very good at sewing. I'm good at everything. I'm good at everything. This is you what are, happens. This I is had why a lot of time. One. I grew up in Azkaban. You had, did. I had a lot of time on my hands to get you know into into a lot of crafts. Um, that we did a lot of plays. Mm. I loved the plays, especially when it was bad. Big Bad Wolf. Every single time, you know, Little Red Riding Hood. Could I be the Big Bad Wolf? I wanted to be every bad character. Sure, I nailed it. Sure. Who was the Who was the the Red Riding? Was it Bellatrix? It was the, stupid serious. <laughs> He's like, I'm the Gryffindor. I'm going to be good. Go for it. I like red. Red for Gryffindor. Okay, go for it. Jabroni. Stupid Siri. Oh, my God. Can't. I'm so glad that guy's not here right now. I heard he was here last year. Yeah. So yeah. glad he's not here. That guy. Oh, What happened to him? I mean, that guy is just flying around doing something. Little Red Riding Hood. I don't know. <laughs> Done with him. Big Bad Wolf's going to get him. Hmm. After you get your hug. <laughs> Can't wait. <sighs> there you go. All right, end, end scene. scene. That's good. Good stuff. Good stuff, Marvin. I like it. I, I've i missed the different perspective. F- favorite segment in all of Mary it's and back, Blake Media. Blake, it's it's back. back. We're back, baby. All right. Potter is officially back. Woo-woo. All right, Marvin, anything else you want to say? We're ready to close I do this want to remind out? our friends that in addition to jointhenerdclan.com, these podcasts are also sponsored by minutewithmary.com. In addition to podcasting, I sell makeup and skincare. Yes, me, this girl that literally spends time pretending to be Barty Crouch Jr., pretending to be the Big Bad Wolf. You're welcome, friends. <laughs> Trust me, I can make you be flawless for the holidays. But no, for real, if you want to try out my award-winning mascara, you can go to minutewithmary.com slash discount. We are giving you, our listeners, a 15% off discount on my best mascara. Or you can just go to minutewithmary.com or you can search the hashtag minutewithmary and find me. I am a tall, freckled, salt and pepper haired lady mm. from Rhode Island so yep. if you find my account and you say Mary I listen to the Potterverse I'm pumped you're back I also agree or disagree that Barty Crouch Jr. was innocent when he was a teenager can we chat makeup or skincare I'm gonna say yeah I'm gonna say yeah let's do this mm, I mean, I'm in I'm in so if you are listening to this submit so with mary.com slash discount for yes. the discount okay yes or just find me on social media and I'll hook you up all right fair enough all right anything else that's it. All right, let's close this bad boy out, shall we? Sure. Thank you all so incredibly much for tuning in. We're so happy to be back. Once again, if you're listening to the future, you have no idea, no idea that time just traveled. We, it wasn't even thir- three clicks should do it. I mean, that was like 30 clicks should do it, okay? <laughs> bippity boppity booed. But friends who have been here and have been waiting, thank you for your patience. The illness issues that I've been dealing with have been pretty crazy. And, um, you know, I don't have a Madame Pomfrey. I try my best. It just, would, it just doesn't work. No, it doesn't. It does not. Um, but we try. So, friends, thank you for your patience. We are back. It's the white hat with the wings that I just I can't get myself into. I can't you, do you it. You wouldn't fit in doorways. You're already too tall. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mary Larson. My name is Blake. Mischief managed. Mischief managed.